it's said that when public health efforts are working, nothing happens. That's equally true normally for those that lead public health institutions. A year ago, most of us were blissfully unaware of who the chief public health officer of Canada was. Now we all know Dr. Theresa Tam. She's had her guiding hand on the tiller at Canada's public health agency, one of many people we've come to count on to steer us through this extraordinary crisis. And with us now on how and hopefully when we'll see the back end of this pandemic, from the nation's capital, we do welcome Dr. Theresa Tam. It's good to finally get you on this program. You're a busy person and very hard to book, so we're grateful for your time, Dr. Tam. How are you doing? I'm very well, and it's good to uh, be on your show. Thank you. We are going to start with a graphic, and for those who are listening on podcast and can't see this graph, uh, I'll just go into it in some detail. It starts a year ago, of course, March 2020, when we first got our first cases of COVID-19 in Canada a little bump up in May, and then as the summer came, things started to settle down a bit, but then the graph goes up, and we get to the fall, and now in the winter, and the numbers are up and up and up, but then they start to come down a little bit. I guess our mitigation measures are working, and here we are in March of 2021, and we see where the lines go under three different scenarios. If more public health measures are lifted, the line goes straight up to heaven, meaning lots of cases. If the current public health measures remain, we still likely get a third wave, according to this graph. And if stronger public health measures are enacted, then we do seem to be able to flatten the curve. So I guess my first question is, in two of these three scenarios, it looks like the worst is yet to come. Is that right? Well, um, in the modeling session that uh, I uh, participated in, we actually had two uh, graphs. Uh, the one that you're showing right now is the one that um, could possibly take place if variants of concern, uh, virus variants that are more transmissible, get in and spread amongst our population. So that's what you're looking at. There's a previous graph which shows what happens when you don't have the variants. Um, and in fact, the measures that we're doing right now has helped a great deal. Canadians is uh, a lot of, um, you know, collaborative measures as well as different levels of government to bring our epidemic curve uh, on a downward slope. We're not, we're sort of two thirds of the way down. We're not actually all the way down this, the side of that second resurgence. If variants take hold, and in this particular curve, uh, if we assume that if they're 50% more transmissible, so um, that, that are the scenarios that can happen. And, you know, people question, well, is that likely or, or not to happen? Well, we've been trying to increase our laboratory detection for the variants uh, of concern uh, from the... There are several of them. Uh, there's three in particular that we're tracking right now. And we do know, for example, in Toronto, that the proportion of the laboratory samples that are screening positive, so some of these variants are increasing. So that is the uh, current concern right now. If these variants take hold, if they are 50% more transmissible, if we let our public me health measures go, um, different scenarios can happen. And what you're seeing are some of them. Are they realistic? Well, I'll just uh, point towards one example of what's just happened in Canada, the province of Newfoundland and Labrador that has done extremely well with almost no cases. A variant comes in and in a matter of days, they've had to deal with a rapidly spreading outbreak. And in Europe, you know, you always have to look at lessons learned from other countries. There is an epidemic curve for Ireland and for um, the United Kingdom that looks very much like one of these upwardly projecting straight up kind of curves. Uh, so this is the kind of scenario that one has to prepare for. No, I understand what? that vigilance is extremely important. And, and obviously those are, your, those are your numbers and your projections that we just put up on the screen a little while ago. And I'm going to ask this next question, and you're just going to have to take my word for it, that I'm not trying to get you into starting a fight with any political level of government in this country right now. I'm really just trying to get my head around this, because clearly with the scenarios that you've just described, we need to stay sharp. 
And yet we do see that in the province of Ontario, while Toronto and Peel and North Bay, I gather, are still locked down pretty tight, uh, there are other regions, even in the greater Toronto area, there are other regions that are beginning to open up some more. I, I, you know, I can drive 15 minutes north of this studio and I can eat indoors, I can go to a gym. That's starting to open up. Does that not feel counter to what you're recommending right now? Yeah, so obviously Canada is a big place, different disease activity in different areas, but you absolutely have to be really careful with easing up measures right now because we do know that particularly the B117 variant is in many different areas of Ontario, as it is in different areas of Canada. All 10 provinces have spotted this particular uh, variety, if you like. And so if jurisdictions, local um, areas are going to ease up, what they have to have are the counterbalances to uh, tackling this virus. They need a testing capacity. That has to be really well ramped up. Uh, we also are advocating screening using more tests. Well, for example, some of the newer technologies and rapid testing to screen certain high-risk settings. So to the best of your knowledge, would they have any of those things in York Region or Durham Region or Holton Region? I, I don't know because that's in the local jurisdiction. Um, in, the, in the federal level, we're supplying provinces with tests and guidance. And also we're partnering with different uh, private sectors. Tests are not the silver bullet. <laughs> tests give you another layer of protection, but you do need a good testing capacity. We're ramping up the testing for the variants. Ontario has ramped up to try screen 100% of the lab positive samples for the variants. That's a good thing. But you've got to test enough people and not miss cases. So with that, um, some of these screening measures help. Really make sure long-term care homes, senior residents are very well protected. That's absolutely key. Secondly, contact tracing. Do you have enough capacity? It is, you know, if, if I did to do contact tracing fast so that uh, the contacts can be quarantined. So that's a capacity issue. And can you safely support the safe isolation of those who need to be isolated or quarantined? That's an important concept because we need the public to be on board, to, sh to show up for testing or to participate in screening. That if they are potential contacts, they need to pick up the phone and get back to public health and get themselves quarantined. And if they don't have the means or their, their household isn't suitable for quarantine, try to access a safer quarantine spot. Those are there all are really some... good questions. Do you have yeah. the answers to those questions? Uh, that's up to the local public health. If you don't have that all in place, it's really difficult to ease up. Okay. The Let's... other thing to do sure, is go ahead. spot the rise. So if you start seeing cases go up, immediately investigate, particularly what we call super spreading events, like there's a cluster of cases, absolutely investigate that really fast and put a lid on it. That is the concept of trying to keep the numbers low. So the, the critical uh, question to all areas is whether you're able to detect and then manage so that to, these numbers are kept low. Because if a variant then takes hold, uh, it's a bit like sort of adding in an accelerant <laughs> to the, you know, getting, putting a bit more gas to this, uh, to this virus and they can take off uh, like it does in other countries. Because we do know that the baseline immunity in the population is quite low and the vaccines are only just getting going. From all the experts I've talked to, the long range solution to this, at least part of the long range solution to all this is making sure that a lot of people get the vaccination. And we wanna put another chart up right now just to give you and our viewers an indication, well, you know all this already, but here's the international race to vaccinate and this is measured in doses per 100 people in the population. And we've all heard that Israel's doing extremely well. They're right up there at the top of the chart, the Seychelles, the United Arab Emirates, the United Kingdom, the Maldives, United States, Bahrain, Serbia, Chile. Along we go down the list, we got to keep going a long way before we finally get to Canada. We are apparently 43rd on this list. 
And I'd like to know what goes through your mind when you see a G7 country like Canada lower on the list than Malta, lower on the list than Turkey, lower on the list than Morocco. I don't mean to criticize those countries, but should we be this far down the list? Well, I think, first of all, um, just to look back, uh, as, as you just said, the vaccine is an absolutely critical tool, I think, in our path forward and in getting, um, you know, seeing um, society reopen up again. So, and we are absolutely fortunate to have two, right now, two very effective vaccines that are safe. So I think viewers need to understand that they are very effective tools. There has been a number of weeks where the supply uh, hasn't been great. Absolutely. But we're seeing the supply ramping up right now. Um, there's certainly uh, the companies that uh, uh, we are getting the first two vaccines from um, are projecting that they are going to deliver us the 6 million doses in total that we need in the first quarter. The second quarter, much larger amounts, and then it escalates even further into the third quarter. So I think our period of drought, if you like, is just beginning to come to an end. There, there's always uncertainties in supply chains, etc., and that's why Canada has essentially got agreements with seven different vaccine uh, companies. But the first two um, very effective and safe vaccines are expected to ramp up in doses, and you're seeing that uh, in terms of the numbers going up in the provinces. So I think keep our eye on the ball. Please, everyone, roll up your sleeves when you get the vaccines. Because one, one, one key concept that we have to remember is it's not vaccines that saves lives. Getting supplies one thing. It's vaccination that saves lives. Mm -hmm. We need to ensure that those vaccines get into people's arms and that people want to get vaccinated. And, um, you know, it, it's absolutely incredible, I have to say, that... Um, the, the long-term care facilities have very high uptake rates. And the North has a, had extremely high uptake rates in the territories. Um, of course, what they're just waiting, making sure that the supplies come and more and more people, people will take that vaccine. And I would stress that if our seniors have done so well with the vaccine that the rest of the population to look towards their leadership, their vaccine champions, and that when the time comes, please roll up your sleeves, because that's the way that you can increase immunity uh, to protect yourself. And we're looking to see if this also increases immunity or community immunity for the population to come. I, I should follow up with this, though. D does it, and, and again, I'm not picking on the current government. From what I've heard, this is a problem that you can go back into time with several governments. The fact that we don't have domestic manufacturing capability for vaccines in this country, again, a G7 country. How massive a policy failure do you think that is? Well, I am, uh, of course, not the policy decision maker, but I think that going forward, it is important. And, and, and some of that biomanufacturing capacity is uh, currently being uh, built. There are uh, some candidates, uh, including one that's included in the uh, suite of seven um, agreements that we have with uh, manufacturing Medicargo, um, a domestic company, and other domestic com um, infrastructures coming on board. So I do think it's a lesson learned. Uh, by the way, we, did, we do have domestic manufacturing for influenza vaccines that has a pandemic contract in place. So we need to be able to broaden that kind of capacity so that we can flexibly respond to whatever pathogen comes along. And there will be another pandemic coming up. So I do think that, um, I hope anyways, as a public health uh, physician, that uh, when this pandemic comes to an end, people don't forget, you need to keep going with those kind of infrastructure and look at what Canada's space is in the world as well in terms of contributing to that manufacturing capacity. I want to ask you a bit about your office and whether you felt uh, adequately resourced to do the job that we are now asking you to do. And I guess in part I'm going back to the audit that was done a half a year ago or so, where the Public Health Agency of Canada was, was said to be uh, lacking adequate scientific expertise in order to tackle the problems that we're now tasking you with solving. Uh, what's your... And in fact, I think I remember you saying um, you got a lot of inaccurate information 
uh, over the course of the past year, which made your work even more difficult. Uh, what's your response to that audit and how it's come along now? Uh, I'm not sure about the last uh, uh, statement that you, you just made, but let's just say that people have to sit back and remember this is an absolutely unprecedented public health event that we have not experienced for like a century. I think that every level of government, every public, every part of this public health system is stretched to the max. And when things first started, of course, nothing can prepare for, for the absolute demands it has on myself, but also on all the other chief medical officers in the country. So I, I do think that we need to bolster up our medical technical expertise. Uh, but there's a wide array of expertise that's needed uh, for public health to function. And for the advice that I am going need to give, there needs to be a lot of people behind me to do that. And has that we been done yet? Ethical. Well, the agency has massively expanded uh, for this moment in time. I have to sort of say that there's many areas of expansion. Uh, I have more... Um, there is more expertise, but every level needs the expertise. They're not easy to find. Uh, we do have more expertise and medical advisors. But the other areas that had to be massively stood up are very operational in nature uh, for the borders and the quarantine service, for the um, stockpiling and all the demands of supplies and providing the surge capacity of provinces had to be escalated in a very dramatic way. And so it is a, a big stress on the system, and, and we're not the only ones by any means. I want to ask you, and again, you're going to just have to take my word for the fact that I'm not asking you to dump on your colleagues here, but I'm just, I'm going to use their names to help frame this question. It seems at least every week, maybe more often, we've got David Williams or Barbara Yaffe or Staney Brown or Lawrence Lowe or Eileen Davila coming on television and saying... If we don't do this, oh my God, this is what's going to happen. And we see the new modeling and so on. And I wonder whether or not you're at all concerned that, um, that we're in a bit of a never cry wolf situation here. Do you worry about that? So, um, in, I'm trying to make sure I understand your question, but of course, um, you know, in, in terms of the evolution of this pandemic, there's a lot of uncertainties. We've been learning about this virus as we go along, and it is a massive humbling experience, I have to say. So you don't know the full sort of, uh, I guess if you look at it as a big puzzle, you don't know everything. Now, I am very, of course, in close touch with all the medical officers across the country, and um, you know we have to communicate what we know at the time that we know it. Uh, we don't know. The, the modeling and the projections are based on the information that we have, and the models are adjusted based on any facts that we have to input into them. And so I think, um, but, but, but just take yourself back to the beginning of that second surge or wave. Of course, we said, by the way, <laughs> you could get a resurgence if you don't do and follow up with public health measures and all of those things and get those capacity in place. And people seem to sort of not quite think that that was going to happen. And of course it happened. Well, that's the um, thing. That's the thing I want to follow up on. Because, you know, the Premier of Ontario likes to use this expression where he says, I know people are getting squirrely. And, and you know, of course we are. You know, this has been a year already. Um, but I guess the question is, how many times can public health pull the fire alarm on this before people start ignoring the fire alarm? Yeah, it is a very difficult thing for the population. But I think one thing right now, we need to focus on things that we can control. And I do think every individual, there's lots of things that people have adapted to do. And the majority of the population is following public health measures. There's definitely some who are not. But... The, the vaccine does bring us hope. What we're saying is, even with the variants, public health measures can control them. We need to keep a lid on this virus and get, and, and get the vaccine programs going. 
and it's not forever, but we need people to sort of continue to do what public health, you listen to your local public health, um, so that this can take place. And the vaccines, ha as I said, have been effective and safe. And if we can just get that going, keeping the lid on that virus. And by the way, spring is coming. People can soon go outside more. We said, you know, avoid these clothes, very crowded, poorly ventilated environments where we have lots of people that you don't know. I mean, we do think that things generally get better as the as people can get outside and, and do these other things safely. Yes, the and evidence so, does indicate that. Hang on there. Yeah. So let me ask you this then, because uh, you've had the past year to look at what is now empirically provable evidence about what percentage of the population is going to adhere to protocols, what percentage of the population is going to get a vaccination when their number comes up. Um, you have to factor into this the fact that we're going to be reopening the economy and society more in the months ahead, presumably as the weather gets better. So taking all of that into account, can you give us some sense about where we are? If, I mean, if this were a three-act play, where are we in the play right now? A three-act play. I think we're probably, you know, as, as I say, there's lots of uncertainties about this virus, but the pandemic will come to an end. While I think it's very difficult to eradicate this particular coronavirus. So there are two slightly different concepts. Every country in the world has this coronavirus. So putting it back into its box in any near future sort of scenario is I think very unlikely. So, but a pandemic and its sharp peaks and et cetera, and different ways will come to an end. I actually think we're probably in the second act, but again, you know, that'll be sticking my neck out and trying to predict something, knowing that we, we not, we, it depends on a number of factors. Let's just unpack this for a second. Yes, you have a vaccine, but how many people will take the vaccine? We hope everybody would. Um, and then, um, you know, how that, that's really critical in the months ahead. What happens to the virus in this evolution? So do we need any, as I say, boosting of the, uh, even people got vaccinated now later on? That's still an outstanding question. Another really key point is that we're in the middle of finding out whether the vaccines protect against infection itself. There's some early signs that it can protect against infections, which means can it protect pe uh, people from transmitting the virus after you got the vaccine? All those uh, slightly uncertain uh, pieces that we don't know yet. But I'm hopeful that if people roll up their sleeves, the supply, you've heard the Prime Minister, end of September, everybody should who needs a dose should get a dose. Um, that will be in such a better spot to cope with any kind of, um, uh, I guess, curveball this virus might throw us. Keep increasing those capacities that we just talked about. I think that before the next fall, uh, you know, remember what we said in the summer and getting ready for the fall season. Before that next fall, we should be much better prepared and not be in a situation where we get massive upswings in resurgence and having to close down, you know, society. We need to come out of this particular wave, try not to let the um, epidemic get out of control again, and then gradually ease things as the vaccine uh, are being deployed. But our models are showing that if a variant, very rapidly spreading variant takes hold, public health measures are still a must. The vaccines won't be enough for quite, quite some time. So these are the different things to balance. Uh, but, you know, the only thing that I know about these viruses is that you got to be constantly vigilant and learning about it and adapt as we go. And I, I do think that both Canadians, the population and the public health system have had to adapt on a very real-time basis. Mm -hmm. Dr. Tam, it's really good of you to join us on TVO tonight. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you for this uh, opportunity.
The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.